All right, so uh, it's time for our second speaker of the evening. Very excited to introduce to all of you one Jeremy Snyder. Uh, very excited. Yeah, some love. Some love. Yeah, yeah. You get another chance to clap in a second, so don't give it all up just yet. Uh, this this uh, fine gentleman is a photographer and science communicator. He went to Pomona College and then did a Thomas J. Watson Fellowship. That's right. Uh, to communicate the science of river systems. He is a science communicator. He works for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where I once worked, uh, and is going to teach us all about the wide, wonderful, weird world of sand. Put your mitts together. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Jeremy Snyder, um, and I'm here today to talk to you guys about something that I feel like is unfairly maligned as being homogenous and boring and not very interesting, um, but I think is really one of the most interesting and kind of uh, profound substances that we interact with all the time, which is sand. Um, and so, believe it or not, I actually, there's more uh, exciting and like world altering stuff to talk about sand uh, than I could fit in a single talk. So this is just, what follows will be one of the many ways that sand is responsible for life as we know it. Um, but I wanna start here with this photo. Uh, this is a bird's eye view of the Amazon River mixing with a blackwater tributary um, and what you can see in this photo is these uh, immense kind of billowing plumes of sediment that is that are carried along uh, in the Amazon River as it flows from the Andes Mountains uh, on the western side of South America down to the Atlantic. Um, and what you can't see is that in and amongst these sediments, there's this precious and invisible cargo uh, that is a key part of why the Amazon rainforest exists at all, why it looks the way it does. Um, and this, the process of how this stuff got there and what it does today and how it is increasingly at risk uh, is what I'm gonna be talking to you guys about today. Um, so we are going to look at how this process plays out in the Amazon and in the Andes, um, but it, it really plays out in a very similar way in every natural landscape on Earth. Uh, it is really one of the most kind of consistent and uh, ubiquitous processes in the world. So this is all kind of a model, a model system. Um, but first, we need to back up and understand a few things. So this is a photo of the birth of sand. Um, and now hopefully in a way that's going to be less awkward than your high school health aid class, uh, I'm going to dive into the details of how the birth of sand really works. Um, now I'm gonna need you guys to all hold on because we're gonna dive into some really technical points that you need to understand. The first of which is mountains are high. <laughs> <laughs> so things that are high up obviously really like to go down. Uh, they have a lot of potential energy, kind of like a ball sitting on top of a hill. Uh, things that are lifted up in the air have potential energy that can convert to kinetic energy as they move down. Uh, in the case of mountains, that ball is billions of tons of rocks that are usually many thousands of feet up in the sky. So there is an immense amount of energy stored in mountains just by virtue of them being high. Um, water is another thing that also likes to move downhill uh, and also has a lot of energy. And so water and uh, rock in mountains often team up in this kind of joint venture of moving rocks downhill. Second really technical point is that when rocks fall from high places, they often smash into smaller rocks. Um, <laughs> you can see this process playing out here uh, in this photo. So you can see, I mean, in the back we have these kind of uh, homogenous, like bulk bedrock mountains. And in the foreground already, you know, kind of along this riverbed, you see these like house sized rocks that are being broken into car sized rocks that are being broken into human sized rocks. Um, and this process is kind of broadly labeled physical weathering. Um, that is kind of a term for any, any of the many ways that rocks can be broken down into smaller rocks, and almost all of them have to do with this kind of journey from high to low. Um, and this 
an important aspect of this is that smaller rocks have more surface area than the than their kind of parent rock, um, which makes them more vulnerable to something called chemical weathering. And that brings us to our third point, and this one is maybe a little less intuitive, which is that rainwater is acidic. Um, so clean, pure rainwater actually has a pH of about five, meaning it's 100 times more acidic than kind of neutral water as we would expect it. Um, and this is because when it falls through the air, it absorbs carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is just floating in the air. And when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, it does something that not a lot of other gases do, which is that it actually reacts with those water molecules. Carbon and dioxide, CO2 and H2O, combine to form a third car compound called carbonic acid. So water, before it has hit the ground, is actually acidic because it's got a significant amount of, carbon of carbonic acid in it. Um, the reason we think of water as, as uh, neutral is because once it hits the ground, it starts reacting with rocks and dissolving them, and it's actually the dissolved minerals that bring it back up to neutral, and that is also why, fun fact, why we call like the water that we drink that tastes good and has minerals in it, mineral water. Um, so th all of these things kind of work together to make sand. Chemical and physical weathering uh, kind of play off of each other, like physical weathering increases the surface area, chemical weathering weakens rock, they go back and forth. Um, and along the way, they do something extremely important as kind of an incidental byproduct. So when you mix acidic rainwater with a rock, let's say granite, uh, like an igneous rock that comes from the Earth's mantle, uh, a few things happen. The first is that the acid eats away at certain minerals that are dissolvable in acid. Um, the, turns them into a dissolved aqueous form, just like if you were to put, say, like table salt in a glass of hot water. Um, the other thing is that some parts of the rock don't get dissolved, but are still chemically altered. Like all of the minerals that do get dissolved kind of have to be stolen from somewhere, and so the stuff that they leave behind is often kind of a different chemical compound. Uh, it's, it's softer, it's stickier, and this is actually where clay comes from. So these altered minerals are clay that ultimately you can use for stuff like pottery. Um, the third kind of component, the third part of the rock, uh, is usually untouched by this acid because it is invulnerable to it. So quartz is a major component of a lot of igneous rocks, and quartz has a really interesting property where it cannot be dissolved by acid, uh, and so it just kind of gets left behind. And this creates this interesting phenomenon where the longer sand exists and the more time rock is exposed to chemical weathering, the more percent quartz it becomes. And this is why you see like white sand beaches, which are made of predominantly quartz, in like really hot, kind of geologically old, far from mountain locations like Florida, whereas in California, where we have mountains really close by, there's like a lot of activity that the sands are predominantly brown because there's not as high of a fraction of quartz. Um, so what gets left behind though is, or what rather is taken away uh, as the weathering process kind of winnows down towards more and more quartz is the really interesting stuff. So you're left with clay, quartz, and dissolved minerals in water. And these dissolved minerals are things like zinc, magnesium, calcium, iron, potassium and uh, phosphorus, and if this reads like a nutrition label to you, that's because it is. Um, so the process of chemical weathering and the creation of sand is the process by which the, like, the minerals in vitamins and minerals are released into the world. Um, so the, all of these compounds, all of these atoms that are essential for the function of life on Earth, for building bones, for operating photosynthesis, for con you know, conducting oxygen in your bloodstream, all of these originally come from rocks, and it is the breakdown of rocks into sediments that liberates them and makes them available to life. So let's go back to the context of the Amazon and the Andes to see, out how, see how these processes play out in the real world. Um, our story starts on these small mountain rivers on the slopes of the Andes in, sorry, in Ecuador. Um, and these mountainsides are kind of the front line of this battle playing out between erosion and uplift. So the still growing Andes are being broken down about as fast as they can grow, uh, boulder by boulder, and being converted into the sand that will eventually fertilize the Amazon. So to understand this process, we need a little bit of context, or geographical context. 
So as we zoom out from the mountains where that photo was taken, we can kind of see that the entire left side, you know, the western side of South America is kind of uh, defined by this big spine of mountains that is the Andes. Uh, and everything to the east of that is this massive tilting watershed uh, that eventually coalesces all of these streams of water flowing out of the out of the mountains flow downhill and they eventually coalesce into this single massive river which is the Amazon River. It's bigger, it's the biggest river in the world by far, bigger than the next seven biggest rivers in the world combined. Um, and so the Amazon watershed is basically this giant tilted bowl uh, for water and which means that it's also kind of a giant tilted funnel for sand. Um, and when you look at this map you can see that only a very small portion of the Amazon watershed is mountains, all this kind of ring along here. But it turns out that these mountains have a immensely outsized impact on really the entire Amazon rainforest, and that is because they are the source of the vast majority of sediments. And this is because mountain rivers are kind of like the teenagers of rivers. They're uh, kind of on the small side, they're at the young, like early stages of a river's you know, overall journey, and they're really moody, they're really tempestuous, they have a ton of energy, they love to take it out on stuff. Um, and all of this is because they are moving down a really steep slope. So these mountain rivers are moving downhill really fast, they have a ton of energy to exert, and all of that energy is great for picking up rocks and smashing them against each other and generating sediments and moving them downstream. Um, combined with the kind of seasonal monsoon and the naturally soft bedrock of the Andes, this creates a recipe for some really extreme generation of sediment. This is also combined with the fact that the Andes are very much still growing, both by really active volcanism and by active uplift by plate tectonics. So you have this like constant input of that kinetic energy of rocks being lifted up high in the air uh, that is just kind of serving up this ball for rivers to kind of keep generating these sediments. Um, so you get this amazing context where like just, you know, fresh, freshly finished, freshly cooled lava and like all of this kind of newly formed rock is immediately being broken down and whisked away uh, in the form of river sediments. And you get these incredible mountain rivers that are strewn with really the graveyard of the Andes. Uh, this is kind of like, a, it's kind of a violent scene. Like all of these boulders have been ripped out of mountainsides. They're being disassembled and dismembered and moved downstream uh, with each successive flood. So this is a video of what that process looks like. This is you know, a, this is a, a pretty violent rapid. It's probably shortly after some flash floods upstream that generated a lot of sediment, but you can see how much mud, how much rock material is in this water. Uh, and it's all just hurtling downstream. And alongside all of that pho uh, potassium, phosphate, nitrogen, all of those things that are generated from the weathering of sediments, you have a lot of carbon that's also coming off of the land. So you have landslides that are sweeping up plant matter and dirt and all this stuff and it's all getting shuttled downstream. And these processes are really the story of why the Andes and really any landscape, especially in the mountains, looks the way it does. Um, so the movement of water and sand really explains a, the like familiar sights and familiar views. So in this picture of Machu Picchu, the dramatic topography that we're seeing is directly the result of all of the generation of sediments, you know, moving down this river. That video of the rapid that was in the last slide was taken on this river right here. Um, and so the, the generation and the movement of sediments is really like the underlying theme of the Andes. Um, and even before that sediment leaves the mountains, it creates life. It really supports life in a pretty amazing way. So this is the Sacred Valley in Peru and uh, these river valleys you can really clearly see how the sediments coming off of the steep hillsides have created this like rich floor of really nutritious 
uh, sediments and soil that can be used for farming. Uh, and this, this entire area has been occupied since Inca times. This is a Inca fortress here on the hill. Um, and this picture also d shows uh, another example of something called an alluvial fan, which uh, actually illustrates a really key phenomenon to understand for the next step of our journey. So this here is an alluvial fan, um, and it illustrates the idea that when water and sediments in water uh, hit a change in slope, they, the water slows down and the sediments drop out. So the end result is that sediments tend to accumulate at the base of hills, and they do so in these kind of interesting fan patterns that are basically the result of the stream that runs down this dropping a bunch of sediment and actually filling up its own riverbed to the point where it suddenly has a lower place to go, and so it moves over to some other channel. And so the river that has deposited all these sediments is kind of like a, it's like a loose fire hose. It's just moving back and forth over this kind of landmass, and it's distributing this nice big fan of alluvium. And as we move out of the Andes and into the Amazon floodplain, that phenomenon starts to happen at like a massive, massive scale. So when you get out into the flat zone of the Amazon, you start to see the sediment dynamics in the river change a lot. Namely, the sand that it's been carrying and really generating and picking up this entire time starts to settle out. And as a result, the sand kind of starts to change the behavior of the river rather than vice versa. Um, so the river starts to have these crazy meandering bends, and you can see in this time-lapse time -lapse satellite footage, which does not seem to want to play, let's try that, um, you can see this is just between 1984 and, the, and 2020, uh, these rivers m migrate massively across the Amazon floodplain, and as they do that, they're literally like farmers, you know, dispersing dispersing fertilizer, dispersing soil, uh, they are building up the literal landmass that the Amazon floodplain is built on. And they've been doing this for the past 10 million years. Uh, so they have both established you know, the ground under the Amazon and they're kind of constantly a source of replenishment today. So beyond building up the land surface, the rich sediments also nurture the richness of the Amazon ecosystem, both its forests and its fisheries. Um, and these ecosystems are the basis of both food and income and livelihood for a, pretty much all of the inhabitants of the Amazon basin, especially indigenous people who still very much live kind of off the land. Um, Massive fish like these are born and raised on river-brought sediment-bound nutrients that you know feed the base of the food chain, these phytoplankton that rely on them, that you know eventually feed these incredible sources of fish. Um, and it, it just kind of illustrates that like as a whole, the Amazon ecosystem is a really severely nutrient-limited system. Uh, it's kind of ironically for being one of the most like vibrantly alive places in the world, there's actually too much life. Uh, and you know, there's really no opportunities for like soil to build up over time because all of the nutrients, all you know, all of the available material raw materials for life are snatched up in an instant. Um, so the kind of constant influx of sediment that the Amazon River represents and all of the sediment flowing off of the Andes, uh, is, it's a lifeline for the entire ecosystem and really the entire Amazon basin. Um, so <laughs> it uh, is just really, I think, really interesting to view the entire richness of the Amazon basin, the Amazon River, uh, in terms of the sediments that it is carrying, because in a very real way, those represent the ground that it is built on, the nutrients that support the life that exists in it. Um, and this is, you know, only one, this is only kind of the middle of the journey. That sand will all empty into the Atlantic Ocean. It will become the, you know, the actual material that's, that uh, beaches are built on all up and down the north, all up and down the South American coast. Um, so sand, in a very real way, is the link between the geosphere and the biosphere. Um, and this whole thing is just this like really elegant, beautiful system, uh, which brings me to the next part, which is, of course, humans are fucking it up. 
<laughs> so, uh, as much as this process like seems like an inexorable fact of Earth's function, uh, and indeed it has been for billions of years, uh, it just so happens that some of the most ambitious and dramatic and wild infrastructure achievements in the history of humankind are giant middle fingers to this entire system in the form of hydropower dams. So the energy and vertical drop that make mountain rivers so useful and so powerful at generating and distributing sediment uh, can also be used, can be co-opted to turn hydropower turbines. And so that is, uh, it's, you know, the logic behind building hydropower dams on large mountain rivers. Um, and <laughs> this has the, you know, the inherent problem that when you stop a river's momentum, when you rob it of its speed, all of that sand settles out. It's the speed, it's the energy that has been carrying that stuff downstream. And you can see this. This is the Coca-Cola Sinclair. It's the largest dam in Ecuador. And it was built, uh, I'm blinking, it was built sometime in the last 20 years. And the already the massive reservoir behind it is almost full of sand that it has stopped from moving downstream. And so obviously not only is this a huge problem for everything downstream, which as I just mentioned relies heavily on this sand, but it's a huge problem for the dam. It's just a terrible design to like build something in a place where it immediately fills up. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of reasons why this doesn't make a lot of sense, not least because all of the carbon, all of the nutrients that those sediments were carrying now sinks to the bottom of these dam reservoirs. It is digested predominantly by anaerobic microbe communities that release that carbon as methane, which is a super powerful greenhouse gas. So. When you take that into account, hydropower often has the same or bigger of a carbon footprint as fossil fuel powered electricity, which to me is fascinating. Um, and this is a really widespread problem. So this map shows the data of planned and uh, existing hydropower dams in the foot of the Andes, uh, the Andean Amazon uh, by size. So the bigger the dot is, the bigger the kind of power generation is, which pretty much translates to the bigger the river. Um, and if just the six biggest of these, of these like several hundred dams are completed, uh, the projected impacts are huge. So one of the papers I read uh, expected that the total phosphorus and nitrogen, which are probably the single two most important plant nutrients, uh, delivered to the Amazon basin would drop by 64, 51, and 23% respectively. So this represents like the, the, the construction of these dams at really the choke point. Uh, you know, the best place for power is the foot of the Andes because that's where the, you have the most water and the most sediments, but it's also the worst place for destroying these natural systems. Um, when you build these, <laughs> you're, you're like very substantially hampering this kind of natural influx that supports really the world's greatest ecosystem. Um, so, I don't know, that's, that's my pitch for like the problems here. But I think to, to move back it out to just like the system at large here and the importance of understanding this, I mean, I think it is, it's fascinating and it's really important to understand how, in, how critical river sediments and just sand have been to human and humankind and like the history of life on Earth. Uh, you can generalize the same processes that happen here out to the Nile, the Yangtze, the, the Ganges, like all of the Tigris and the Euphrates, all of the formative kind of starts of human civilization were built very literally on the rich sediments brought by rivers. Um, and all life on Earth dating back to like the Cambrian explosion of complex life 500 million years ago depended on the byproducts released during Sam's journey from bedrock to beach. So sand is very, in a very real sense, the link between the biosphere and the geosphere. Um, and so with that, I hope this image uh, and all of the sand in it are a little richer for you uh, and a little more interesting. And you can see in your own life how the surface of our planet is really defined by the movement and generation and uh, kind of use of sand. Um, and as cool as all of this is, uh, the story I told you today is just one leg of the sediment cycle. Uh, in many ways, sand is just this like transitory state between different types of rock. And the story of how sand eventually turns back into rock, with, often with the help of living things, uh, it, to me is just as fascinating and is perhaps even more important to the function of our planet. So hopefully I will get to tell that at some future nerd night. Um, but that is my story. Wow.
and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that all of these, all of these photos, all of this work uh, came about as part of this fellowship that I got to do after college. Um, and so I, you know, huge thank you to the foundation that awarded that uh, and all of the people who helped me along the way. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, I see a hand. Yeah, I can't see anything up here, so. <laughs> you gotta be loud. Yes, uh, I mean, the, the simple answer is that there's a lot of different pathways. Uh, the two, you know, the kind of, I guess the three core ones are either as sandstone, as limestone, or as be, by being subducted back into the Earth's crust and remelted into, you know, the next generation of igneous rocks. How long does it take like a school bus sized rock to become sand? I think that depends massively on where it is. So, um, you know, you look at a school bus sized rock in like a super high energy environment, like this photo at the beginning. I mean that, you know, this one here, if anything's bigger than a school bus, I, I, you know, I couldn't tell you like to the year, but the order of magnitude is like thousands of years, which is a blink of an eye in, in geological timescales. Like, you know, in, in a really high energy system where every century or so you're going to have an insane flash flood where, you know, that's like just moving crazy amounts of material, like things, things will break and, as, you know, the bigger they are, the, the kind of more susceptible they are to break under their own weight. Okay. Yeah. Last question, make it good. Which process is faster, uh, turning rock into sand or sand into back to rock? Oh, uh, again, super dependent. Uh, I think broadly, you could probably say that rock to sand is faster. So are we gonna run out of rock at some point? No, I mean, because it's, it, this, is, this is what I think is like profound and like extremely cool about it, is like the sediment cycle very much is like the way that Earth recycles itself. Like the breakdown of, you know, rock is basically uplifted as magma through, you know, through volcanism, it's uplifted through tectonics and it's put high in the sky in a way that it can become sand. And the story of sand is really like the entire intervening chapter uh, where it's like reorganized and rebunched, but ultimately like that material doesn't go anywhere. So it's subsumed back into the earth. It's turned into a different kind of rock. Like, you know, for every, for every grain of sand that is generated, another one is consumed. <laughs> All right.